my family in Christ, I have two questions for you. I'm going to ask them as I walk over here because I forgot my clicker. Two questions for you. One, what do you want to get out of life? And two, what are you willing to do to get it? Now, not too long ago, earlier this week, there was an eight-year-old boy in East Palestine, Ohio, who knew what he wanted to get out of his life, at least in that moment after 8 o'clock at night. He wanted a cheeseburger. He wanted a cheeseburger so bad that he went on YouTube and learned to drive a car. Because he didn't want just any cheeseburger, he wanted McDonald's cheeseburgers. And so he was willing to go on YouTube, learn how to drive a car, take the keys from his parents who had gone to bed early that night, get into the car with his four-year-old sister, and drive the couple of miles to the nearest McDonald's. Now apparently he did a really good job. All the witnesses that called the police because there was an eight-year-old driving a car, said he was very respectful of the ru rules of the road. <laughs> because he got to McDonald's just fine. He even got up to the drive through window just fine. <laughs> and he got his order in just fine. The workers were convinced this was a prank until they noticed there was nobody else in the back seat of the car. This little boy must have been high on the world. Just, I got my cheeseburger, I got my ride. All came crashing down when the police officer came and had to explain to him that this was wrong. The tears came and he was very sad. But he still got his cheeseburger. <laughs> and his parents came to pick him up and everything was okay. Nobody was hurt. Everything was just fine. But that's not the way it always works, right? Two sisters, just this past Thursday night, uh, both from North Carolina, one was a GCU student. Both of them wanted to see the sunrise at Grand Canyon. So they drove in the middle of the night, they left in the middle of the night, and early Friday morning, early Friday morning, they, I'm sorry, this is bugging me. There we go. How's the sound now? We'll take it. We'll take it. We'll, we'll, we'll roll with it. These two sisters driving early Friday morning with the intention of getting the Grand Canyon for sunrise, wanting to experience something new, something just for themselves, ended up getting in a head on collision with another student from GCU. And all three died. They had their goal, they had their dream, and it didn't work out. They didn't get there. And now their families are dealing with the aftermath of losing these young lives who thought they had a future, thought they were going to accomplish so much more. The one daughter or the one sister was going to graduate this spring. High on the world, right? Going to graduate, have my sister here. And then things change. It makes us realize that the victories of this world do not last very long sometimes. Because very easily do we become defeated. Very easily can life change. And all of a sudden when we thought that a road of victory was before us, suddenly becomes a pit of defeat, not knowing how we're going to get out of it. You might know very well that feeling if you've ever had to sit beside a grave of a loved one, wondering what you're going to do next. You might have had to think that if a spouse ever had to speak to you words that you never thought you were going to have to hear from them. You might have thought that if you looked at your income and looked what you've had to spend and wondered, these two things don't match up. Victories of this world don't always last very long, and the defeats seem to come fast and powerfully. So what we're here to talk about today on Easter is the fact that we have a victory that does last. 
A victory that exists even in the face of all the defeats that this sinful world can throw at us. You can still say you have victory through it all. Why? Because this is a victory that you didn't have to fight for. It's a victory that has already been fought for and given to you. It's a victory that's not of this perishable dying world. It's a victory that comes from somewhere else. And so it's a victory that lasts. That's the victory we're going to dive into talking about a little bit more today as we look at our main sermon text for the day taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So I invite you to open up your worship folder or look up on the screen here. As you look to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is known as the resurrection chapter. Because the Apostle Paul spends so much time in this chapter talking about the beauty of the resurrection and the importance of it and the fact that it belongs to you. That the resurrection of Jesus is not just real, but it's real for you. And the blessings of it are real for you. And the Corinthians needed to know that very, very well. They needed a reminder of it. I would imagine you do too. So please follow along as we hear this glorious reminder of a victory like none other from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of God. Now, it was only a couple of weeks ago that March Madness came to an end. The University of North Carolina came out the victors. They had won the championship again. But in Chapel Hill, when that victory came, as one writer put it, you wouldn't have suspected that they had ever won a championship game before in the history of the school. Because as that victory was coming, in downtown Chapel Hill, first dozens of people started entering into the streets. Then it turned into hundreds. And then thousands. And before you knew it, 55,000 people were in the streets of Chapel Hill celebrating the victory of their basketball team. And of course they would. We would all expect that there would be some sort of victory celebration when you're the champion. Because when we have a victory that matters to us, we show it. Now we know that's true. That's true. The Apostle Paul knew that's true too. That's precisely why the book of 1 Corinthians is kind of a frustrating book. Because as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he was writing to them because their lives did not show that the victory of Christ mattered very much to them. What they did day to day did not reflect that they thought the victory of Christ was much of a victory at all. You see, many of the Corinthians were wondering if Jesus had even ever risen from the dead. And so, as a result, many of the Corinthians didn't think that they would ever rise from the dead. And so they thought that this message of Jesus was just helpful for the day-to-day -day lives. But instead, so instead for their happiness, for their hope, for their pleasure, they had to look to the things of this world. The Apostle Paul said that they kind of developed this philosophy of eat, drink, and, and be merry because tomorrow we die. Because all they thought they had to look forward to, all they thought they could enjoy is the stuff right now. And what they knew is that the stuff right now doesn't last. The most that they could hope for is, is one more day to enjoy it. Because the end was coming. Apostle Paul reminded them that if that's, if that's all that being a Christian was about, if that's all that, that Jesus came to give us, then, then this is what's true. He said, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. That if all Jesus came to give us was a hopeful philosophy 
to have a different perspective on this world, then, then we should be pitied. Because Jesus tells us to give up this world, to sacrifice things, to live for him, not for this world. And so if we constantly give up the things of this world and this is all we have, then, then in the end we need to be pitied because we're left with nothing. But why would the Corinthians think that way? Well, it's because their world was scary. They lived in a constantly changing world where everything good seemed like it could break the next second. Everything that they loved seemed like it could be taken away by somebody more powerful than them. Everything that they loved seemed like it would be gone the next day. Because that's how the world usually works. Usually what you see is what you get. So the good things around you right now, then that, that's probably all you'll ever have. So hang on to them, because you're going to lose them at the next moment anyways. Is that how sometimes we look at life? That what we see is what we're going to get? That the most that we can have is the hand that we've been dealt? That when you hear that cancer, is not just a not just a concept, but it's something you have? Is that what you're stuck with forever? When somebody hurts you that you trusted, that you cared about, and that betrayal sets in, is that, is that all you're ever going to have? When that loved one who meant the world to you has been taken away, does that mean you are cursed to no longer have hope and love and meaning forever? That's what the world usually tells us. Is that what you see is what you're going to get. And what we're used to seeing is we're used to seeing defeat. We're used to seeing betrayal. We're used to seeing sin. We're used to seeing our own shortcomings, our own failures. We're used to seeing that when somebody dies, they, they don't come back. They, they stay in the grave. That's what we're used to seeing. So maybe like the Corinthians, maybe we think that that's all we're ever going to get. And so maybe we develop different ways to cope with it, just like the Corinthians did. Different ways to medicate ourselves or try to escape from reality as often as possible because the reality is too frightening to bear. Or maybe we, we take to being really upset about the state of the world and let all the social media know about it, but we don't do anything to help. Maybe we give in to despair that all we're ever going to see is another hurtful day. The Corinthians weren't the only ones to struggle with that. The two Marys in our gospel lesson struggled with that too. They went to the grave of Jesus that day, not expecting to have an Easter celebration. They went to the grave that day expecting a body to still be in the grave. Luke's account, the Gospel of Luke, tells us the added detail that they had brought more burial spices because that's what you do. They saw their teacher and friend die. What you see is what you get. They saw the dead body, so what they thought they would get that morning was a dead body. And so they went there with defeat on their minds, not a lot of hope. Have you ever have talked to a loved one who's lost somebody that they care about? Sometimes how we cope with the reality of death can be very hard. Sometimes we don't know what to say. The poet and undertaker, Thomas Lynch, once said that would he witness a lot of people saying to loved ones when they look at somebody who has died, and say that that's just, that's just a shell. That's not the person you cared about. That's just a shell. The problem is that when you say that to somebody right after their loved one has died, that's, that's not really helpful. Because the truth is that those were the arms that hugged them. Those were the ears that listened to them. That was the mouth that that spoke words of encouragement and hope. To say that that's just a shell, that's, that's not really helpful. 
the Marys, that wouldn't have encouraged them at all. If they would have gone to that tomb and, and just heard that it's just, it's just a shell in that tomb, that wouldn't have changed their life at all. But what did change their lives was what they did here instead. That they didn't hear some sort of coping mechanism. Instead, they heard a victory. So when they got to that tomb, they didn't see a dead body, but they saw an angel who said this to them. He said, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. When they got to the tomb, they didn't see somebody who was just trying to make them feel better. They saw somebody who was letting them know of a victory that would actually change their lives. A real victory that, just, that wouldn't just change their perspective, but change their reality. Winston Churchill once famously said that history is written by the victors. His point was that Whoever wins the war gets to rewrite the perspective on what happened during the war. They're the ones who, gets, who get to say who were the bad guys and who were the good guys. What were the good things that were done? What were the bad things that were done? It's all up to the victors. They get to put the spin on it. What the angel was reminding the, the Marys that morning was that there was no spin to be had here. The victor was actually changing reality. He wasn't just giving them a different, happier, more positive perspective. He was changing the way the world worked itself, just as he said he would. Just as he said throughout his life that he was not just some new prophet, some, some shell of teachings that couldn't change the world. Instead, he was God himself. Much more than a shell, he was God in the flesh, there to give his life as a ransom for many. Just as Jesus had said countless times during his ministry that he had come into this world, a dark world, to bring a light that the world could never extinguish. That even though he would have to suffer, they would have to die, he would come back. That is what Jesus said. That the things of this world that often lead to our defeat would be the very things that he would have victory over. And so, our world changes. This is what the Apostle Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians when he said this in our reading today. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Usually, usually what we see is what we get. And so as you look back on your life and you see your shortcomings, you see your sins, you see your guilt, it's easy to think that's all you're going to get. As you look ahead to your life and see the future, maybe not the future you planned on, you're tempted to think that that's all you're going to get. But because God entered this world with the one goal to change your life forever, and since he really did accomplish it, your entire life changes. The sin that you should be counted guilty for, because all of us fall short of the glory of God, that sin was put on Jesus on the cross. As those nails were put into him, as he let out those words of suffering, that sin was already suffered for. It was already bled for. That law that should condemn you for your sin, that law has been overturned. You instead stand as innocent people in God's eyes. This is how the Apostle Paul put it in Romans. He said, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The way the world normally works is that you are guilty for what you do. And as a result, you die. That is the way the world works. But because of Christ, the world no longer works that way. Because of Christ removing our sin, 
removing the condemnation of the law, you now have victory. As you look back at your past and see the things you know you're guilty for, as you look ahead at your future and see consequences that you never thought would last this long, still you're dealing with them, you get to approach those things knowing that you have victory. You have victory through your Lord Jesus Christ because the battle's already been fought and it's already been won. God's not asking you to fight the battle now in order to get the victory. He says this victory is for you. And so now you get to say those words of praise. Get to say with the Apostle Paul, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Because as you look at the world around you, as you look at the things that, that you fear, challenges in the family, fear of the future, guilt of the past, as you look at all of that, you get to remember where your victory comes from. That if Jesus really is your way and truth and life, if Jesus really is your, your fortress and your rock, then, then what can overcome you? Because what power in this world is mightier than our Savior God? What sickness is stronger than our Lord? What terrorist attack can frighten our God away? The devil himself had Jesus killed. And yet Jesus rose from the dead. Death tried to keep Jesus in the tomb, and yet Jesus lives. The weight of our sins on Jesus tried to crush him down, and yet Jesus reigns. What challenge, what fear, what attack of this world can stand up to that power? Nothing. Thanks be to God, you have victory over it all through Jesus Christ. A victory that you cannot find anywhere else. Because only Jesus said it. This is what the Corinthians were reminded of. The Apostle Paul told them that this is, this is the victory that changed his life forever. From somebody who used to attack and persecute Christians, now he was willing to suffer for the sake of spreading this news of victory that these Corinthians could go and find even 300 people that had seen the risen Savior with their own eyes, they could know that this resurrection was real. And so they could know their victory was real too. Because Jesus was not a shell. Jesus was flesh and blood. And that precious blood of Christ, worth more than silver, worth more than gold, has redeemed you from the law, but you back from your sins. You have victory. And so like the Marys, the next time you walk up to something that seems like it has already defeated you, walk up to that thing that seems like will hold its defeat over you forever. The next time you walk that lonely road, remember you don't walk it by yourself. You walk it with your victorious Savior by your side. Your Savior who has given that victory to you so that you can face that grave of a loved one and say, this victory belongs to me. So you can face that sin that you struggle with inside of the family and know that it doesn't reign because this victory belongs to me. You can face a world that is struggling with death and violence and greediness. You face those things and say, this victory belongs to me. Because thanks be to God, we have victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing can defeat that. Nothing can take that victory away. This victory belongs to you. Amen. Please pray with me now. Heavenly Father, as we have so much to fear in this world, remind us that these things cannot overcome you because you have already overcome them. In your victory, you have over, already overcome sin, already overcome death, and so we know we live in victory now and live in victory forever. 
Please clothe us with that truth every day. Let us dig into that truth every day of our lives so that we know that we have nothing but hope, nothing but an eternal life to look forward to. Because this victory you won for us, it does belong to us. In your name we pray. Amen.